Thanks, Diana. Um, if we could bring my slides up, that'd be great. Uh, so as Diana mentioned, this report, uh, fortunately, time came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, that I wrote along with a colleague Powder at um, New Local, which was formerly called New Local Government Network until a few weeks ago, just a rebrand, uh, and in partnership with the Lloyds Bank Foundation. But I guess um, if we move on to the next slide, I guess what we're what we are focusing on in this report is probably it's not specifically about left behind neighbourhoods as a whole, but it's about a subset uh, of the population that are going to be much more uh, much overrepresented within left behind neighbourhoods. So particularly people with disabilities and health conditions. But the way we defined it in the report is people experiencing complex disadvantage. So it's about unemployment, often long term unemployment combined with things like disabilities and health conditions and then a whole bunch of social disadvantages that often accompany that and are going to be more prevalent in left behind neighbourhoods. So things like uh, poverty and debt, most obviously, but also uh, low education and attainment, issues with, with housing and other social issues, um, and then sometimes more extreme issues like contact with the criminal justice system, drug and alcohol misuse. And for us, it's about how these different elements and different disadvantages come together and combine and compound one another. And that's where this idea of complexity comes from, that um, these issues are all interrelated and can't be addressed in isolation. Um, but within the benefit system and within the kind of DWP-led system, I guess a proxy for this group would be the 2.3 million people who are on uh, benefits like employment and support allowance and, and subset of universal credit. Uh, for people who have disabilities and health conditions, and that's that's uh, limiting their ability to work. A huge group of people, um, only around 4% of this group move into employment each year. And as a, as a group, that group is growing over time. So more people are joining that benefit group than are moving off it. Um, and really, in I mean, in the time that I've been, in 10 years, I've been working on these issues, but I'd say much longer than that, I mean, at least the last 20 years, there haven't really been significant improvements in outcomes for this group. So there's been kind of various different approaches that I'd argue are all within a similar mold led by DWP and the, the impact on outcomes hasn't, hasn't changed much. But more than that, it's not just that the system is ineffective. Actually, for many people, uh, it's actively damaging. So people talk about the impact on their mental health of difficulties around applying for and maintaining their benefit claims, um, difficulties in interacting with the department and, and being mandated onto, onto job support, um, sometimes um, being subject to sanctions as a result of the system. And the long-term impact of this is that people, there's quite low willingness to engage with the support because of the department's reputation and because of people's experience of interacting with the benefit system and, and DWP. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide. So, as I said, I've worked on these issues for a number of years and I spent 18 months um, on secondment inside DWP and following that time I wrote a paper for the think tank Demos where basically I, I argued that it's not just that there's been poor policy and poor implementation around benefits and back to work support for people facing complex disadvantage. I think it runs much deeper than that. I think there's deep rooted systemic, cultural, institutional problems with the way this issue is approached, which is why we haven't seen any significant improvements in experience or outcomes. Um, and there's kind of three main reasons for that that I cited in this in this paper for Demos, which came out last year. The first is just the, the fundamental nature of the relationship between this group of people and DWP and the Job Centre. People are seen and treated as benefit claimants first and foremost, and the relationship with DWP has a fundamental power imbalance. They're, they're expected to do things in return for that claim. If you look at the type of helping relationships that lead to people being able to be supported to make major life changes, it's all about trust and rapport, and the evidence bears this out, that you need these personalised, trusting relationships. And my argument is that the nature of the relationship between DWP and the Job Centre and this group um preclude really the chance to, to build the type of relationships that are needed and then alongside that the department you know it's the biggest government department it, it delivers a lot of the policy that it makes and it's wedded to certain approaches and infrastructure and assumptions and my experience inside the department is that this massively narrows the scope uh, of delivery at, and and the opportunity to do, do things differently and then the third point 
which I touched on on the last slide, is that even if you could significantly improve the quality of support delivered by DWP and job centres and contracted provision, um, the lack of trust between particularly this group because of their experience of things like work capability assessments and other aspects of the system, lack of, lack of trust is so significant, even if the support was better, people would not engage with it. This is a system that on the whole people can with rather than enthusiastically engaging with and it's that type of engagement that you need to, to help people make significant changes in their lives. Uh, so if we move on to the next slide. So we started out this research project and report wanting to focus on how you might rather than wanting to focus sorry on how you might just improve the current system and tweak aspects of how DWP does, does things. We wanted to think about what a system might look like if you weren't constrained by the parameters of the current system if you started with the people who needed support and the places and communities they actually live in so forgetting about the baggage of the benefit system the current procedural and physical infrastructure that exists but instead starting from scratch and thinking about how you build a system that better supported people who are facing this kind of complex disadvantage so this table here sets kind of a, a broad picture of the contrast between the current system on the left and the type of approach we wanted to aim for uh, on the right. And there's a more detailed version of this within the report if you want to look at it. Um, so the next slide. So with that kind of framework in mind, we started speaking to a range of local commissioners and providers, so within local authorities, within the NHS, within um, largely within the third sector, so lots of small local specialist providers, many of them charities, Talk to them about how they work at the moment uh, when it comes to supporting this group. And we heard about many strengths that already align with the kind of vision we wanted to set out. So firstly, those kind of trusting personalised relationships I talked about earlier, that's the thing these providers focus on above all else. Um, it's the thing that they're well placed to achieve and it's something they're very effective at. Um, providers and commissioners that we spoke to um, really understand intimately their local communities um, the local areas they serve and the local ecosystems of support that can be harnessed to help address uh, the multiple and complex needs people face uh, thirdly because of their the shared ethos and commitment of these local commissioners and providers um, they're often effective at working in partnership to support people across a range of needs and then finally um, these commissioners and providers are well placed to engage with and often try to actually actively shape the local labour market um, to try to foster appropriate and supportive employment opportunities for, for this group. If we move on to the next slide. But we also heard about uh, serious limitations on the ability uh, of providers and commissioners to deliver the type of support they'd like to. Um, these services are often constrained by contracts that don't give them the freedom, resources or long-term security to really develop and grow. It's difficult for many local and specialist providers to get access to DWP funding in the first place. They often have to do that as subcontractors to larger generic national uh, prime providers. There have been moves in recent years to allow local, greater local control, so devolution to London, uh, Greater Manchester, West Midlands, for example. The people we spoke to who have been involved in these devolution processes said that they were still having to design and deliver services very much within the parameters of this existing DWP model. Then, fourthly, the, the wider impact of underfunding of local authorities, the NHS, third sector over many years, undermines the ability of providers who are focusing on employment support to effectively help people facing complex disadvantage because often they're getting drawn into having to address other issues people are experiencing that aren't being sufficiently addressed by uh, core services. Um, even though local services are very keen to collaborate and work in partnership, the combination of kind of remote control of this system from Whitehall and quite a marketized approach to commissioning often undermines uh, efforts to work in partnership. And then finally, the, the dominance of the DWP in the system, even where it's not DWP directly involved in, in this local provision, for many people, employment support uh, has become synonymous with benefits uh, and the job center. Uh, and this undermines the ability of local providers and commissioners to convince people uh, facing complex disadvantage that what they're offering is actually something quite different. People are often just afraid to engage fear of 
uh, losing financial support um, first and foremost, but also just because they don't feel this is something that's designed for them and is appropriate for them. Uh, so then the next slide. So we came up uh, with recommendations based on these insights and we thought about what it would take to overcome the problems with the current system and move us towards something more like the vision for a community-led approach that we set out in the report. Ultimately, the scale of transformation we're talking about is going to take major changes in national policy. Uh, and, and we're talking about something quite different to what we've, what we've had over the last 20 years. So we argue that essentially DWP is ill-suited and badly placed to engage effectively with this group that we're talking about. And that they should move to being responsible for providing financial support, but not providing the type of employment support that we looked at in the report. Um, and the financial support people receive needs to be paid at a level that provides genuine security. It should be more straightforward to access and retain. Um, that system should create less stress and strain for people to allow them more bandwidth to focus on things like uh, employment support. The £700 million pounds or so that DWP currently commits to employment support for this group should be devolved to local areas to boost their existing efforts. And local areas should also share in the savings DWP and Treasury make if people move from long-term uh, benefit receipt into work. Um, the process of devolving these resources should actively encourage and support local areas to develop community-led approaches that help people facing complex disadvantage move towards employment. And then finally, the kind of wider national social and economic policy uh, at national level should foster an inclusive economy across the country to help to address some of the structural inequalities that contribute towards the type of disadvantage experience. Uh, and then the final slide is about how we suggest this happens at a local level. And ideally, this would happen with the kind of additional power and resources set out in the previous slide. But even in the absence of those kind of major national changes we're calling for, we think local areas can already make a start on demonstrating the value of the type of approach we describe. And some local areas are doing this and building the case for change. So that's about um, developing strategies for what local support services should look like and critically working in collaboration with the communities they will serve through participatory deliberative approaches to really understand the needs, strengths, aspirations and resources that exist within communities. Um, secondly, ensuring that employment is embedded as an objective, a cross-cutting objective within the strategy to ensure it's seen as something that's, a re that's relevant to all services, supporting people. Um, you know, I do think that good work with right support is beneficial for people's health, particularly their mental health, and we do need to be ambitious about what people can achieve. And this can only be achieved if people are bought in. Um, so uh, the services themselves should be designed and delivered by or in collaboration with the communities that they'll be supporting, particularly focusing on engaging and empowering people facing complex disadvantage who might otherwise struggle to engage with those types of processes. And then finally, the funding and evaluation for these services um, should promote a kind of holistic, collaborative approach within a local community that maximises the opportunity for community participation. That's the report, um, a really whistle stop tour of the report we published a couple of weeks ago. I'd encourage people to take a kind of a uh, deeper look there's lots of detail in there uh, and we just really hope it provides a kind of stronger vision for how this system could be approached in, in a fundamentally different way to provide uh, the type of support people actually need uh, and start to make some progress towards um, you know addressing things like the disability employment gap and the scale of unemployment uh, in areas where people are experiencing multiple disadvantages like this.